Okay, I have 88 slides to get through and 50 minutes. Uh, that's the amount of time that it took me when I practiced four times yesterday. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I am going to be talking about dark forest in five parts. The first is the introduction, the second, I'm going to explain what dark forest actually is. Um, in the third part, I'm going to be explaining what it takes to run dark forest, i.e. how we think about the features and mechanics and other components that go into actually making dark forest. Part four, I'm going to be talking about DAOs, aka the people that actually play dark forest, and we're going to be talking about some of the reasons that they play and some of the reasons that they build for dark forest. And finally, the fifth part, which is titled part four, uh, I'm going to be talking about what's next for Dark Forest. So that's a little bit of an overview so that you don't get confused because it's kind of a long one. So part zero, introduction, uh, Dark Forest, and I've been with the project since about November 2020. And since then, I have launched six rounds of the Dark Forest video game. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to share some of the things we've learned. There's going to be very little speculation. I'm not going to be trying to sell you on a very big vision or anything like that. I'm just going to be describing some of the things that I've seen that I think are interesting that might inspire the rest of you to also build and stick with what you have been building. Um, the other reason for this talk is to inspire you to think bigger than what you see. I think a lot of... Uh, people approach crypto with skepticism, and I simply think that that is because they don't see the opportunity presented before them, and also I think that there's more than the surface level of Dark Forest that we haven't shared that you will also see, and that will allow you to think bigger about it. And also start a timer, because that is... What is Dark Forest? So Dark Forest is a crypto-native game. I'm not going to be describing what that is, because Everybody today has, I think, done a pretty good job of that. It's a real-time strategy game. Um, I think that's pretty cool and awesome, given the fact that it runs on a blockchain, which typically is pretty slow. It's infinite and procedurally generated. And finally, it is experimental software. So although we do ship to production, one of the defining features or attributes of the Dark Force project is that we do really focus on experimenting and trying new things, not necessarily motivated by profit. We are super motivated by learning. Okay, so what is Dark Forest literally? Well, Dark Forest has this aspect of a large infinite procedurally generated universe in which you mine the universe in order to discover what exactly exists in this universe. So I'm going to play this video. Hopefully it plays. You're going to see this white cursor scroll around and what it's doing is it's discovering planets in this infinite procedurally generated universe and you are able to interact with these planets by owning them, accumulating energy on them, and send, sending energy between planets as well. Energy accumulates according to an S-curve on planets, so it generates slowly at first, generates quicker when you have some amount of energy on the planet, and then it generates slower again when you have a lot of energy on the planet. This is basically like the core mechanic of Dark Forest. Energy is sent, you use it to explore new areas in the game, as well as take over other people's planets. So, Dark Forest, I think, is super interesting because it uses ZK technology to have private state on the blockchain. When you send energy between planets and you interact with the in-game entities, what you're interacting with is encrypted versions of them. Basically, instead of revealing the locations of the planets that you are sending via smart contract calls, you are referring to all of the planets via their hashes. To explain a little further, here is an example of how Dark Force could be implemented without ZK. The player is trying to send some amount of energy from one planet to another planet, and they invoke the smart contract, 
and they ask the smart contract, please send some amount of energy from the planet at coordinate this to coordinate that. And then on the smart contract side, we store all of the planets indexed by their locations. Uh, one problem with this approach is that this approach means all of your information is public. So due to the fact that this information is on the blockchain, somebody could download it and use it to basically figure out what you're doing and attack you and destroy you, and that's not very good. So instead of that, there's encrypted versions of the locations to refer to all of the planets, and it allows you to interact with them by allowing you to submit ZK proofs that prove that you actually know the locations of all of the planets before you are able to interact with them. So this means that although all of the data for all of the planets is still in the blockchain and publicly accessible, you don't know which of the planets are actually which. And this allows you to have private state and um, until you mine out the universe, you basically are incapable of knowing what's going on in the game. The final aspect of Dark Forest, the final like set of game mechanics that we have available for players to play around with, are in-game items, which we refer to as artifacts or spaceships. You can put them on planets and uh, send them between different planets, and they all have some aspect of like game mechanics. So for example, spaceships have passive buffs that allow you to uh, change and increase the power of your planets. There are also artifacts such as the Photoid Cannon, which you can activate and it allows you to charge up a super powerful attack that you can use to annihilate your opponents from very far away. So I'm going to play this video and it'll show you that on the planet. Alright, I think that's enough of this video. Alright, so those are all the component parts of Dark Forest. Let's put them all together and allow you to actually see how they play and interplay with each other. This is a screen recording from the most recent round of Dark Forest, round 5. And you are able to see a very, very large procedurally generated universe. So the previous videos I took on a local instance of the game, which is very small, not very interesting, but in this instance of the game, uh, in the most recent round of Dark Forest, we had around 1,800 players, and I think the radius of the universe was uh, around 150,000 world units. And that means we had a very dynamic game, it lasted 10 days, and as I zoom and pan around this video, you're going to be able to see a lot of distinct empires that are controlled by individual players. Each empire is uh, indicated by its color, so some of them are going to be pink, cyan, yellow, etc., etc. And you're going to see there's going to be lots of localized battles between different empires. So this is the very zoomed out view. Here I'm showing a battle that's going on between some cyan person. This person sending a bunch of spaceships. They're exploiting game mechanics to beat other players. You can see this player has a bunch of artifacts floating around on their planet. The most fascinating thing I think about this for me is the game kind of feels like a fractal i.e. you zoom in and all of the gameplay that you see that manifests at the large scale is also present at the smaller scale. Alright, so that's the gameplay of Dark Forest. There are several components of Dark Forest that are not gameplay related that are still pretty key to understanding how this thing works. The plugin system is super interesting. You can copy paste code from the internet and that allows you to programmatically interact with the game. So a couple examples of some things you can do include automating war or overlaying the face of Nicolas Cage on a planet. Um, we have this website called plugins.zkga.me which 
contains 55 plugins that have all been peer reviewed by different players and DAOs and core contributors to the game. Some of my favorite plugins are the Wage War plugin, which allows you to completely automate war. It allows you to input an enemy and then the game automatically manages basically destroying them. Another cool plugin is this Peace Dove plugin over here. Uh, one of the in-game features for Dark Forest is that you can place emojis on your planets and people oftentimes want to play the game without engaging in war, so this allows them to communicate to their neighbors, I am peaceful. There's actually a lot of thought that went into this emoji feature. I don't really like or want to moderate people's uh, in-game chats because a lot of the time people abuse that and say vulgar things, so instead the only way that you can communicate within the game of Dark Forest is emojis. Uh, another component part of Dark Forest is that we leverage open source contributions. So this plugins repository is completely open source. Anybody can submit a plugin, anybody can review a plugin, anybody can test a plugin. And at the end, it results in this beautiful website in which we have many plugins and people are able to use them as they wish. So we have an internal mono repo uh, in which we do all of our development. And whenever we deploy a new production version of the game, this gets mirrored and split up into its component parts and put into our publicly accessible open source Dark Forest ETH organization on GitHub. So you can find the client there, the circuits, all of the Ethereum solidity code, etc., etc. So zooming out a little further, we've talked about the game mechanics, we've talked about our software development processes. How does one actually experience Dark Forest? Well, the main way that people experience Dark Forest is through core rounds. We release these every couple of months, and our intention is to deploy some sort of new game mechanics, some sort of new experiments with the blockchain, and to see how the community of Dark Forest players, who's composed of you know, Solidity developers, JavaScript developers, we want to see what exactly they're going to do with these new primitives. Each round, we try to release something new. Uh, again, our goal is to be an experimental software that proves out new uh, blockchain software development primitives. We're not necessarily trying to grow the game to be the maximal size that it can be at this point. Why would one want to play Dark Forest? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. People like to flex their development skills. It's a very nerdy game. Uh, but one of the biggest reasons is that we give people Valhalla prize points. The top 63 players in every single round. The minor rounds are played usually by thousands of players. So top 63 is a pretty contentious, uh, pretty contentious set of spots. So we give top 63 players all the planets, and these are moon net NFTs, which are currently useless, and all they do is they prove that you're a very good Dark Forest player. Another way to play Dark Forest is via lobbies. So we built this really awesome system that allows you to deploy Dark Forest with one click without having to be a software developer. All you need to do is navigate yourself to zkga.me slash lobbies, uh, which allows you to configure a brand new universe and deploy it via a transaction on chain. And what this is doing is it's cloning the currently live Dark Forest universe, allowing you to configure it, deploying it as a new smart contract, which you are the admin and owner of. And this means previously uh, Dark Forest was a very limited experience. You had to get a whitelist key to play. Now Lobbies allows anybody to play Dark Forest at any time. Okay, that is all of the things, all of the component parts that make up Dark Forest. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like the reasoning of how we uh, approach developing stuff for Dark Forest. Um, there's only one person inside. So um, what does that mean? It means I can actually, you know, engage with people and harness all of this latent energy and excitement that people have for uh, on-chain games in order to do more cool and good stuff. So here's an example of something that I did pretty recently. We have this plugins repository. Somebody has to review those plugins. It's not trivial because you have to understand code, you have to understand Dark Forest, you have to understand uh, code review, best practices, all of that stuff. So how do you get 27 pull requests reviewed? I'm not gonna do that all myself. 
Instead, I set up a system by which anybody could contribute. There was a spreadsheet. I organized nine volunteers, which is insane to me. There's nine people out there in this world that are just willing to code review for free. It's free work. Oh my god, that's crazy. And we were able to review all of these plugins and get them merged, and now there are more plugins and more Dark Force for people to enjoy. So community engagement for me is pretty satisfying. Uh, another example of community engagement is we ran this art contest, and this resulted in a bunch of really cool Dark Forest art being created. So here's a couple of examples. This one's really fascinating. Each planet has a different kooky, cool face. I really like it. This one's really abstract. Uh, yeah. Community engagement, super important for Dark Forest. There's tons more I could talk about there, but I only have an hour here. All right. Game design in a thoughtful world. So our game is a crypto-native game. A lot of people have talked about how this means you can have permissionless interoperability. Well, with permissionless interoperability, one of the things that you get is the fact that sometimes people interoperate with your game in ways that you don't want, or you don't like, or you don't enjoy, or other people don't enjoy. So. A lot of people play Dark Forest as individuals, but also a lot of people build bots for Dark Forest, and they completely crush and annihilate individual players. This has been a pretty controversial sort of paradigm in terms of gameplay, and there are a lot of things that we can do to mitigate the effects of this, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that we built that failed to take this into account, which resulted in a less than ideal Dark Forest experience for our players. So, one example of uh, a way in which people can take advantage of this interoperable game with bots is by civil attacking it. Basically, making use of multiple accounts in order to gain some sort of advantage. So, in Dark Forest V0.6 round 5, which is this most recent round, one of the features that we released is this set of spaceships. Spaceships can move around between planets, and the key feature that they have is that they are able to passively buff a planet that they land on. So the passive buff that I see in question that is problematic here is this uh, oh, the energy regeneration of a planet. Uh, experienced game designers here might already be sort of shocked and appalled that this is a feature in the game, and the reason for this is this image right here, which is a horrible, horrible thing that happened in round five. Basically, people were able to stack spaceships on top of each other by having multiple accounts, which allowed them to double and then quadruple and then multiply by eight, and eventually by 1024, the energy regeneration of a planet. So multiplying the energy regeneration of a planet by a thousand basically means you have infinite energy. And if you have infinite energy, you can basically annihilate in like a completely uncontested way every single other player in the game. This was a horrible oversight in game design by yours truly, and it taught me a valuable lesson. So, what are the lessons that this taught me? Uh, memorialize this mistake in a POAP, which is an NFT that we gave to all the participants of Dark Forest. Anyway, uh, what did we learn? You don't give players powerful things for free. Players have to earn power in your game. If you give people things for free, they will collude with each other and multiply the effects of the free things that you give. So, what else do players get for free in this game? They get a whole planet for free. You know, this is literally the least that we can give a player for free, and even that has been abused before. What can you get with a free home planet? Well, you can have multiple accounts, one of which is your main account, another account you can spawn far, far away, and then now you have a portal into some other far off part of the universe. Even this can be abused. It's just ridiculous. Designing games in blockchain with bots and anybody can you know, interoperate and get infinite accounts is just very difficult. Another thing that we can do in order to mitigate the effects of bots in Dark Forest is by actually making more game. Yeah, like, what we can do so. is make it so that people have more stuff to do, more stuff to think about, and yeah, actually have to make strategic trade-offs. Uh, here's an example of a way in which players did not have to make strategic trade-offs previously. So what I'm going to show you here is a plugin called the Crawl plugin. The Crawl plugin 
Commands allows you to configure the plugin with some parameters, and then you click one button, and this plugin basically expands your empire automatically for you by spidering out from some central planet out further and further and further. Like, this is a very natural thing to do. If your game involves sending energy between planets and it's that simple to automate it, people are going to automate it. Unfortunately, this was one of the first plugins that were built for Dark Forest, and this basically means that unless you know about plugins, unless you know about scripting, you have essentially no chance of uh, fighting against the players that do. How do we mitigate this in Dark Forest? Well, again, in the most recent version of Dark Forest, we had several features. One of the features that we built, please let me go to the next slide. Yeah, one of the features that we built is called Space Junk. Space Junk is embodied in this image right here. I think it's beautiful. This was the round art for the most recent round of the game. But essentially what we did is we introduced a cost to acquiring new planets. So if any of you have ever played uh, strategy games before, like for example, Age of Empires or Starcraft, one of the things that exists in these games is this concept of a population cap. Basically, you can only have a maximum amount of units before you are unable to craft new units. So, what did we see as a result of Space Chunk? Well, empires indeed felt smaller. If you recall that round five footage video that I showed, there were a lot of localized empires, like the yellow guy over here or the cyan guy over here. Nevertheless, this was not enough to actually prevent people from Sybil attacking the game. It had a similar problem as spaceships. Essentially what you could do is you could collude, you could have multiple accounts that come together and donate space junk to each other, which means that, again, normal players who were not smart enough, not clever enough, were playing by the rules as intended and they got limited in the exact ways that we intended them to get limited by. But the people who were clever, again, did not and were able to have larger empires and crush everybody else. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> okay, so an overview of what we talked about so far. What does it take to build Dark Forest? So there's game design. Uh, considerations we have to take into account are civil resistance, balancing features. There's community engagement. So things like reviewing plugins, running the rounds themselves, uh, giving people prizes, making sure that they feel you know heard, etc. There's this aspect of technical innovation. So we have features like uh, ZK Fog of War, and there's technical execution, so whatever we build, we have to make sure that we don't have very many bugs, otherwise people get upset. Um, and then the final thing that we have to take into account when building Dark Forest is artistic and creative direction. It's a video game after all, so if it's not like unique and interesting, if it doesn't make you believe that you're playing in a whole new world, nobody's going to be playing this game. What have I done so far? I have explained the game, what it's made of. I have also explained what it takes to build the game, i.e. how we think about building it. And then this next part, I'm going to be talking about the DAOs. And that might seem like a strange direction to go, but trust me, it goes in a very interesting direction. So my claim, by the way, is that DAOs are not DAOs. Most DAOs are just clubs. They're just sets of people who are doing something. Um, you could call this a DAO, you know what I mean? Okay, so this is the part of the presentation that starts to get a little kooky and interesting. Uh, the above image is an image of me. Uh, you can imagine Dark Forest, the core team, as a laboratory technician, and we are inspecting what is going on in the game via a microscope, and the things that are going on in the game are represented by these Petri dishes. The Petri dishes are Dark Forest universes, and then all of the stuff that's growing in the Dark Forest universes, all the bacteria, that's all of you guys. That's all of the players and the down and um, other builders. So uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of all of the DAOs that I have seen, uh, i.e. all of the clubs or groups of people that have built for Dark Forest previously. Uh, basically, this is like a taxonomy or an encyclopedia of these little creatures that run around in the petri dishes. So the first DAO that I'm going to talk about is called Project Sofon. Um, if the members of this DAO were here, they would hate me for calling them a DAO. They are not a DAO. 
I think they are down nevertheless. Um, the members of Project Sofon, they actually reached out to the Dark Forest Core development team themselves and they were like, you know, this game is really awesome, what can we do to help? And since then, they have been a pretty integral part of Dark Forest, uh, despite being an external organization. So, uh, some examples of stuff that they've built include this repository called Dark Forest Local, which is a repo that puts together all of the different components of the open source stuff that we put out and allows you to run the game locally on your own computer. That is pretty awesome because it means you can experiment, it means you can play the game for free without having to pay x time, etc, etc. Um, another thing they've done is they put out this plugin which was a unique take on all of the you know, hype and play to earn stuff that's going on in the blockchain space, except they did it in a very, very interesting and unique way. They basically introduced what I like to think of as a service economy into Dark Forest. You can exchange an action from other players. So one of the things that you can do in Dark Forest is you can reveal planets of other players in order to essentially dox them. Kind of like in how in the book of Dark Forest, if you reveal uh, somebody's location, then an alien civilization is going to come and destroy them. In the game of Dark Forest, you can broadcast, and that mean, means that your enemy is now vulnerable to attack by anybody, even if they haven't mined the location at which this empire exists. So this uh, Dark Forest play to earn plugin uh, creates a liquid market for this sort of doxing. Next uh, DAO that I'm going to briefly talk about is called DF Archon. DF Archon, I don't really have a lot to say about them, apart from the fact that they make cute little plugins, they have good vibes, they participate in our ecosystem by reviewing plugins and stuff like that. Uh, their signature, the signature aspect of all of their plugins seems to be these little circles that they draw around planets and these circles represent various things. Like for example, one of their plugins allows you to highlight all of the planets that have an artifact on them. And then you get this like bubbly little circle around it. Um, this image was generated by DF Archon wow. and it is generated using a plugin and it is a snapshot of a particular moment in time in the war that occurred during round five. You can see like just how much stuff is going on. I think this is a pretty cool representation. Okay, another DAO, this is the third DAO that I'm gonna talk about, is called Orden GG. So these people are extremely hardcore players. They are not only hardcore players, they are hardcore builders as well. Overall, just a set of very hardcore dudes. It's pretty crazy. Uh, in their Twitter bio, you can see the bold claim of number one ELO Dark Forest. And they back this up, actually, with skills. They won the most recent four rounds of Dark Forest. Uh, of course, they shared the title of number one with DF DAO, which is another DAO I'm going to get into a little bit later. Um, they're also builders. So uh, skipping forward a little bit, the main game that Orden GG plays is called Avogachi, and they have built an entire open source client for this game in which they have built a bunch of new features that you know take advantage of the trustless interoperability that's promised by crypto native games, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they build for Avogachi mainly. Uh, the reason for this, in my belief, is that Avogachi is actually a pretty financialized game at this point. They have like tokens, they have all of these financial incentives for playing it. Um, Dark Forest has none of this, so they don't build as much for Dark Forest, but they love playing the game, so they throw us morsels, you know, whenever they get the chance. Apparently, they're building something pretty cool for Q4. I don't think I can talk about it yet, but keep your eyes peeled. Okay, the next DAO I'm going to talk about is DF DAO. DF DAO is actually here. Maybe they can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so DF DAO, uh, I'm going to try to not say too much in case I can or anything like that, but basically this DAO I consider to be a pretty experimental DAO. They vibe pretty deeply with the stuff that we do and we vibe with them and we're very happy that they participate in our ecosystem. Uh, some of the stuff that they're interested in includes line chain governance. Um, they also believe pretty strongly in the crypto native gaming thesis that Gupshi put out, and they're an American DAO. Uh, to give a couple of examples of the stuff that they built for Dark Forest, uh, one thing is the Astral Colossus, which I think is a pretty quintessential embodiment of this 
concept of interoperability. Basically, the idea is that they created a smart contract player, which they whitelisted into the game. The smart contract player isn't able to make moves. It's not able to collect artifacts. It's not able to, you know, mine the universe. It's just a piece of code. So how exactly, like, does it win? What's the point of having a smart contract player? Well, one of the features that they built for the Astral Colossus is the ability to donate score in a trustless and permissionless way. Basically, uh, how this worked is the smart contract had a function, which you could call as an atomic transaction, which allowed you to take a planet that you own, transfer it to this Astral Colossus. The Astral Colossus takes score off the planet and gives you back the planet. Normally, in another game, like let's say you're playing, I don't know, RuneScape or something, someone comes up to you and is like, hey, give me your, you know, iron and a stick and I'll make you a pickaxe because my crafting level is higher than yours. You give them your stuff and they run away and you are left looking like an idiot. So, due to the fact that the Dark Forest is implemented on a blockchain and it's like a crypto native game, this is actually impossible with the way that they implemented it. It happens atomically, i.e. you give them their uh, the planet with the stuff on it, and they give it back to you after taking the score off, that either completes, you know, in total, like, as an atomic unit, or it does not complete, which means you can trust it, and blah blah blah. Of course you have to read the source code, so it's not an ideal sort of situation, but, you know, it demonstrates an interesting experiment. Another thing, they, uh, they built a community round, i.e. like a deployment of Dark Forest, which, by the way, was built using do 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 Dark Forest Local, uh, which is this repository again that allows you to play Dark Forest locally, built by Project Sofon. They built a community round, which is a round of Dark Forest built entirely by the community. It had several new features, and uh, I'll get into community rounds a little bit later because I think they're pretty important. But that's like a little bit of an overview of what this DAO does. Another DAO, this is I think DAO number four, Mero DAO, they're a Chinese DAO. They seem pretty commercially inclined, i.e. they're not extremely interested in winning the game, but they are super interested in facilitating the game and deploying the game, getting more people to play the game, and also building on top of the game. So as an example, uh, one of the, the things they did is they also released a community round of Dark Forest, and they also have their own artifact marketplace. As a little bit of an aside, uh, you might think that uh, artifact marketplace is the ideal thing for the Dark Forest core team to build because it just is obvious. You know, you're a crypto native game, you must have some sort of in game economy that people uh, trade items in that demonstrate the fact that you've got, like, you know, an economy and that you can make money. Well, one of the core philosophies or like reasons or ways that we figure out what to build and what not to build is that we see ourselves as building more of like a surface area rather than features themselves. So we introduce items and we see what happens as a result of that. And the result of introducing items has been pretty cool. We see three different independent artifact marketplaces that have been built for Dark Forest. Uh, if we had built one, we had, would have not seen like innovation on this front. We would have just squatted on that concept. Anyway, so Merodao Community Round, uh, they've also built this artifact plugin, artifact, and some other stuff. Okay, PDAO. PDAO is one of the more recent DAOs that has come into existence. Unfortunately, oh actually maybe I can, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this out loud to you guys because this text is very small. So. PDAO, again, uh, is a DAO that only started to exist in round 5 of Dark Forest, and here's what they said to me that they wanted the world to know. Our voice chat channel lasted from the beginning of the round to the end, and we focused on a high level of information sharing to eliminate the effects of poor information as much as possible. There were people online at every time to discuss it, especially before the audio Occupy script was created, and community members would alert you in various ways once your territory had painted a yellow circle. This kind of cooperation gave us relatively big advantage early on. We also adapted a strategy of two people in a squad, which could solve the problem of resource contention, and likewise have better defensive ability when facing DFDAO, Orden GG, and their attacks. Based on this approach, we achieved the following results. Any newcomer who joins the game at any time will be able to know the situation on the battlefield and how he should develop at the first time. 
Each member of the team has basically the same level of skill awareness for the round, limiting potential competitors in a cooperative manner in the latter stages, thus allowing a better development environment for the lower, lower ranked members. And in the end, we had a good result with seven of our members, seven members of our organization in the top 10. This is a cooperative approach that we try to innovate in. Most of us resent an authority demanding how we should play the game. So we give self-help control of the game to the players themselves. So uh, to show their results, here again is a screenshot that shows the members of PDAO placing pretty well in the most recent round of Dark Forest. And this is kind of how I like to think of them. PDAO is like a lone bastion of human intelligence that stands against all of the botters, all of the people that collude and take advantage of our game mechanics for their benefit. They're kind of like Neo from The Matrix, or you know, the main characters of this one anime sort of are online. Okay, several of the DAOs that I mentioned, by the way, those were all the DAOs, I hope you found that interesting. I think it's pretty funny. It's kind of like a zoo, you know? They're all very different. Anyway, uh, community rounds. So what is a community round? Well, one of the things that DFDAO did for us is they documented the process of building and deploying a brand new, unique dark forest universe for us. And what this means is there now exists a document which anybody can go to, uh, follow like five instructions, click a bunch of buttons, click clack on the computer, and boom, a new Dark Forest universe exists. Uh, believe it or not, this was a, like a pretty big work of emotional labor to get to this place. Because in the beginning, we were not even certain that we wanted to commit to this whole crypto-native open source uh, situation that we've got going on with Dark Forest. Somebody actually forked our game about a year ago, didn't tell us about it, and tried to start their own community. And we were pretty pissed. We did not like that this happened. Um, in the end, we decided that open source is our strength and we need to lean into this as much as possible. So I decided to preempt all future malicious forks by documenting how to deploy Dark Forest and putting a label of approval. So now we kind of own the Community Round brand. Um, so one example of a Community Round is DFDAO's round. First of all, look at this beautiful image. Again, you let people do what you want. Let people do what they want, and they do amazing stuff, and they surprise you. So the set of changes that they implemented for their community round was actually pretty non-trivial. So there are a few trivial changes, like for example, changing some of the parameters of the universe, like the speed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also had to tinker around with the ZK circuits of the game. Uh, the game, instead of increasing in size as time went on, it was shrinking. And if, finally, one of the things that they did is they implemented this feature where if you send a sufficient amount of energy to a planet, once that energy arrives, it destroys that planet. Um, so you can kind of think of this as like a modded Minecraft server or the equivalent of that for Dark Forest. So what did that take? Two parts that I spent a bunch of time on explaining what Dark Forest is and like what it takes to build Dark Forest. On the right, I have what it takes to build Dark Forest on our end, and on the left, I have what it took to build that community round from the end of the DAO. So community engagement. They tweeted about this. They uh, let people actually vote on the feature that they would implement for this round. This took technical execution. Tony, I know for a fact, sat there late at night hacking away on all of our scripts and messaged us a bunch of questions and stuff like that. It took a bunch of creativity because, again, look at this beautiful image. Look at the concept. It's a the death of the universe round. Um, game design. Uh, there were several options that were all you know, thought up of by several different people, and they were all probably more well thought out than the spaceships that I mentioned earlier. And that resulted in a pretty interesting round. Anyway, so you can see all of the stuff that the DAO had to do, we also had to do. And all of the stuff that we had to do, the DAO had to do. That will be a theme. Uh, the next community round that uh, I wanted to talk about is this one by that one DAO called Marrow DAO. They built this, uh, they actually beat DF DAO to market in terms of community rounds. And this is 
they squatted on this concept of dark forest community around one, which I find pretty amusing personally. But anyway, look at this image. Look at this image. It's beautiful. It's designed beautifully. It's got this interesting concept of red versus blue. So basically, uh, the, the concept of this round was that once you join the game, you are allocated to either the red team or the blue team. And this allows you to have this giant team battle uh, in the game. And, you know, what did that take? It took community engagement. It took technical execution. It took creative direction. I did not add game design because red versus blue is not really like game design genius or anything like that. But, you know, it did take a, a bunch of work. And a lot of that work was analogous to the stuff that we do as Dark Force Core. Okay, 277 down, um, represented by somebody here. Woo! Shout out! Woo! 277 <laughs> down, the latest entrant into the Dark Forest arena of building community rounds. So uh, check them out, they're pretty cool. Uh, the way they build their community rounds is they don't actually write any code. What they do is they take advantage of the lobby system that they built, sorry, that we built, in order to quickly deploy new Dark Forest universes and they incentivize participation via different prizes, like for example, x NFT, or POAPs, kind of like the POAP that we gave for round five. So we do that too. Dark Forest Core incentivizes participation, via giving out prizes, we engage with people on Twitter, etc., etc. So what did that take? Community engagement, creative direction, versus what we do. You know, pretty close, pretty interesting, what's going on here? Okay, so going back to this image of Dark Forest Core, inspecting um, these DAOs via a microscope, looking at this petri dish situation of little guys crawling around and doing interesting stuff. Um, here's a quote, battle not with monsters, lest you become a monster. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. So I'm not sure whether or not that's the situation here, but I feel like I've been looking at the DAOs for long enough that I basically see myself in them. So what's going on here is actually not us inspecting the DAOs with a microscope. What's going on here is that we are looking into a mirror and what's going on here is that what we see in the mirror is myself, you know, ourselves, and what, what's, going, what's going on here, you know? Um, it's petri dishes, it's universes looking into each other, into a mirror, and this is the final sort of unhinged image that I'm gonna show that kind of demonstrates uh, this concept. I hope you like it. I hope you like it. Well, my claim is that Dark Forest Core is just another DAO, and all of the DAOs are just Dark Forest Core, and a DAO is just a club, and a club is just a bunch of guys and girls, and we're all basically one big, happy family of people building Dark Forest. We all have our own strengths and weaknesses. Some of us are creative, some of us are builders, some of us are the priest Neo of the Matrix that are the counterbalance to the automation and the bots. And what's going on here is that we're like Power Rangers and we all have our roles to play in the ecosystem. And we combine to become stronger than what we are individually. The sum is greater than the sum of the parts or, or something. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that begs the question like, Am I just giving this game away? Like, are people just free to do whatever they want with it? Like, am I just taking myself out of the equation? Maybe in the long term, I think that would be really cool to just give the thing away. And just kind of like carve Mount Rushmore into the face of Ethereum and walk away. That would be super sick. But I think that's not feasible at the moment. I think what's going on here really is kind of best represented by this image from Stuart Brand. So. This is the order of civilization. The fast layers innovate, the slow layers stabilize, the whole combines learning of continuity. So what's going on here is Dark Force Core, you know, the people who build the protocol, we are responsible to uh, our community and we show what is possible. First of all, we establish the ground rules. What is nature? You have planets, you have energy. You send energy from planets to other planets. There is ZK. There's open source, blah, 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 you know? And then at the 
higher levels of abstraction, all of these other players can come in and they can demonstrate their own take on what Dark Forest is. I think that's pretty interesting and cool, um, which is the title of this talk. Okay, so what's next? We talked about what Dark Forest is, we talked about what it takes to run Dark Forest, uh, we talked about all of the different people that participate in this. So the next question is, but basically what is going on here, this is like an alternate, alternate perspective or, you know, bird's eye view of what I just described. So there's Dark Forest, we have our core rounds, we release them occasionally, more frequently, hopefully, we have these community rounds, which are rounds that are built and developed by people outside of the Dark Forest core team. Uh, finally, we have lobbies, which are short-lived instances of the game. They can also be used as uh, community rounds. And okay, so this is the this is the like bird's eye view. Here is where I hope to get is that we get you know many many Power Ranger guys to come in and become the biggest sum that is greater than its sum of, of a whole something. And, uh, okay, concretely, the next thing that I want to experiment with is to take everything that's going on here, uh, from core rounds to community rounds to lobbies, and somehow tie it all together. And I think one of the most interesting directions to go in this respect is to introduce persistence into Dark Force. Basically, at this point, every single round is short-lived, you know, 10 days isn't that long on the scale of 100 years or something like that. So everything that happens in an individual Dark Forest rounds, it, it just kind of disappears once the round is over. Um, how do we get to a place where we have one canonical Dark Forest universe which exists forever, which doesn't have an admin? Uh, that's a big ask. So until then, we're going to be experimenting with persistence. We're going to be experimenting with letting people carry over stuff between rounds. Maybe you get to carry over some sort of reputation system. Maybe you get to carry over an inventory system, etc., etc., etc. So that's the thing that I'm going to be focusing on in the coming months. Um, the other thing that I want to get to is to a place where we can execute at a very, very high velocity because currently the team is pretty small and I have to code a lot and that is pretty exhausting. So I want to hire more people. I want to get more hands on deck. Um, so if that sounds like something that you are interested in or want to help out with, please let me know. Uh, this is my information that you can have now to connect with me. So, yeah, that was interesting things in Dark Forest. I hope you enjoyed. I know it was a little bit of a long talk, but 